sure he had a great concern in his heart to reach the city of Chicago, such a vast city, and wanting to know, God, how can it be done? And as he was waiting on God and spending quite a bit of time... See, now that you're a Christian and you love Jesus, you want to show him here how much you love him up there. And so you do this and this and this and this and this, and for seven solid years, with the utmost intensity and sincerity, I tried to live for Christ. Mm -hmm. At the age of 15, began to preach, having given myself for missionary service. Age of 17, went to London University, study medicine, go to, doc go to Africa as a doctor, mm -hmm. leading the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, preaching most days of the week, organizing a slum club, spending my vacations as a camp counselor or organizer, mm -hmm. until at the age of 19, I was tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this ship. was a this was a struggle. It was on a treadmill. Oh, you were you were doing what you could for Christ, of course, and with the utmost sincerity. Mm. But at the at the end, after 19 years, you see, at the age of 19, I simply said, Lord, yeah, I love you with all my heart. Could never ever doubt that you've redeemed me. I have no greater ambition but than to serve you. Mm. But I'm tired. I'm weary. Mm. I look back over seven years and I see nothing but noise and dust. Mm. Others would commend me for my zeal, for my involvement. But there's only one honest thing to do. If I go to Africa, I'd be as useless there as I am in England. Wouldn't be fair to them, wouldn't be fair to you, wouldn't be fair to myself. There's only one reasonable thing to do, and that is quit. <laughs> Not quit being a Christian. How did the Lord respond to you? I was in tears. And when I said, I quit, I don't have what it takes. He said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to be very disappointed. <laughs> he sighed with relief. He said, for seven years you've been trying to live for me, mm -hmm. a life that only I can live within you. Mm -hmm. You've preached me as the way and the truth. You've never once appropriated me as your life. Mm -hmm. You see? And suddenly it was a flash of revelation. It was nothing new that I needed to receive. Mm -hmm. I didn't need some special, you know, psychedelic, soul-stirring emotional experience, all I needed to discover was how wealthy I had begun at the age of 12 when he, Christ, came to live within me. Mm -hmm. But with Christ in residence, I'd lived for all those seven years from the day of my conversion as though he went there, begging mm -hmm. for the things, give me this and give me that, strength, blessing, health, victory, make me a blessing, all the things that were already mine in Christ. What a release. Right. That brings out uh, the question. You mentioned that, that key word, appropriation. Yes. appropriating mm -hmm. uh, what Christ had already become for you. Yes. How did this take on an actual uh, experience on a day-by-day -day basis? When you normally went through the motions of this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing and trying to do yes. what you felt Christ would have you do, how did this appropriation aspect become a reality and it lessened the strain on That's you? That's a very good question. I was reduced to the simplicity which is in Christ. The Bible says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And I was thrown back upon that simplicity of faith that takes God at His word, acts on the assumption that what He says He'll do, and says, thank you. How did I receive Him as my Redeemer? Convicted of the Holy Spirit of my need, guilty, lost, and lifeless. Acquainted now with the fact that He died to redeem me. I exposed my need, invited him to my, be my redeemer, took him in his word and said, thank you. And what I discovered was that it was no less true that the Christ who died for me rose again to live in me than that he had given himself for me. And if I was to walk in him as once I had received him, all I needed to do for every step I took and for every situation to which that step took me, bow myself out, bow him in, Recognize that all that he was, I had, couldn't have more, need never enjoy less. Expose the situation in my inadequacy to his overwhelming sufficiency and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, you're in business. If you need hands, here they are. If you need lips to speak with, here they are, mine to think with. I'm just available for you to handle this situation. I don't ask you to help me handle it. I want to thank you now that when you gave yourself for me, you did so to give yourself to me. And so now I take for what you are in me as once I took what you did for me. In other words, in all its sublime simplicity, to my mind, the true expression of a faith that lets God do it is to say thank you. Mm -hmm. In everything, give thanks. Now this has taken the strain out of your Christian life. Oh.
takes the ulcers <laughs> and all the stress and, and nervous tension. Now, I'm sure the viewers are wondering, well, now, is Major Thomas ever frustrated? Does he ever feel that maybe he has failed and that he couldn't do what he was supposed to have done in a given situation? Do you ever run into those times? When of course. But what's the immediate handle solution? That? Immediately expose it to the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. And remember that he's never expected us to be any less a failure than we are. Mm -hmm. That's a, a source to me of immense, immense comfort. We're never, ever at any time a bigger failure than God always expects us to be, <laughs> apart from Christ. He's not surprised then, huh? Not a bit surprised. <laughs> you see, and we've got to recognize that. And when I feel a sense of frustration, I know it's for only one reason. I've handled it myself. Mm -hmm. So get back to home base. Don't allow Satan to capitalize. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. I... I don't even know how to clean up the mess I've made, mm. but you do, so I'm back where I belong, and you're in business. Should the Christian carry around guilt over past failures? No. Like some people will struggle, oh, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. I failed in such a miserable way. And it interferes with, let's say, the continued relationship with the Lord. Nothing that Satan desires more. Mm. God has said, I will remember your sins no more. And mm. we don't have the right to remember what God has forgotten. Mm. We must always remember what we are, mm -hmm. that old Adam nature still there. Mm -hmm. That we must never forget. That is the nature of sin. Mm. But what we've done and God has cleansed, that he forgets. Mm -hmm. So I must be aware of what I am. That always reminds me of my need of who he is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see. Mm -hmm. But I can forget for his dear sake what I've done because of what he did. Mm -hmm. And that's the gospel. Major Thomas, you're involved in the torchbearers. You have dual residency. You're in Colorado when you're here, yes. and then you're in England as well. Uh, what is going on at these two places? Well, at our international headquarters, where in 1947 I started the torchbearers of the Cape and Missionary Fellowship, we have a Bible camp conference program. That is still the main thrust. And it's internationalized. We've had well over 100,000 young people, literally from all over the world. And the main Bible camp thrust is evangelistic in character in the commonly accepted sense. In other words, a whole bunch of them, sometimes 40, 50, 60 percent, are totally unchurched. Mm -hmm. And we'll expose them to the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus, which is where it must begin. Mm -hmm. But we don't consider that to be evangelism. That's the first evangelistic outreach, to lead them redemptively to the, Lord, to the Lord Jesus. But to evangelize means that we introduce them to the full remedial measures that God has introduced, not only in the Christ who died for us, but the one who rose again to live in us. That they may recognize how marvelously they've been equipped and furnished for every good work by virtue of the fact that there's no situation in their lives that now can ever arise for which the Lord Jesus, risen, creator, redeemer, living within them could be ever less than big enough. So as they come to know Christ redemptively, we lead them in to enjoy Christ indwelling regeneratively, imparting the life of God to the soul of man, indispensable to the likeness of God in the character of man, changing behavior. And for that reason, we've introduced short-term non-vocational Bible schools, 30 weeks maximum in residence, reproduced not only in Cape and Rain, England, but now two in Germany, two in Austria, one in Sweden, in the United States, in Estes Park, Colorado, in Texas, near San Antonio, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, now in India, and soon in Indonesia, and other mm. mini schools in Southeast Asia. We're having a school next year in Manila, the Philippines. And the object of these schools isn't to prepare people to become ministers or preachers or evangelists or missionaries. Every Christian is a living, healthy member of the body of Christ is in the full-time service of the one of whose body they're members and whose life they share. We're simply seeking to teach men and women, and for the Bible school program, it's 18 years in age and upwards, no age limit upwards, to know what it really means to be a Christian, mm -hmm. to let Jesus Christ actually be God in their lives, mm -hmm. and then let them loose all over the world. Mm. You see, if you, if you spend your time producing preachers, well, that's good, but that doesn't guarantee you're going to produce Christians. But if you major upon producing real Christians who are prepared to let Jesus Christ himself loose in their lives, inevitably you'll produce preachers, missionaries, mm -hmm. evangelists, mm -hmm. men and women who are in every kind of vocation, engineers, plumbers, motor mechanics, housewives, mm -hmm. school teachers. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Mm. 
It's been our privilege to have you as our guest on this program and to hear the concepts that God has laid upon your heart and the way in which he's using you and your ministry around the world. And I'd like to say thank you so much for being our guest and may the Lord continue to bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Thurman, so much.